Welcome to the Max Weber Lectures. Um, we have our guest today, Peter Katzenstein, Professor of International Relations at Cornell University. He was actually born and raised in Germany, but no worries, we will do this interview in English and not in German. <laughs> and because he moved to the US uh, to get his undergraduate um, degree from Swarthmore College, uh, then a master's from LSE and a PhD in Harvard on the relations between Germany and Austria since 1815. He's been in Cornell since 1973 already. Um, now as a Walter S. Carpenter Professor of International Studies um, since 1980 until today. His research started out on international political economy in the 1970s, then moved on to security topics in the 1990s, but his focus over the years has been on the questions of norms and identity in world politics. And that culminated in a recent research project on civilizations, um, where he became the editor of a trilogy of books, um, civilizations essentially covering civilizations beyond East and West. And um, if I can summarize it like this, but we will talk about this topic um, now a little bit. And um, I first would like to ask you whether you can um, explain the concept of civilizations as you use it in the book um, to our audience. Good question. Civilizations for many people means listening to, a, listening to one message. Uh, Hunting's book of civilization paints the different civilization in one color. And uh, he will talk about the core lessons of values, or the coherence of a, of a culture. And uh, my image is one where civilizations are like a conversation in our heads. There are lots of voices interacting, and we're trying to figure out which voice to listen to. That's the difference. And why did you feel this concept now, at this point of time, necessary to introduce it to IR research? What, what is the promise of, of the concept that we are now giving? Well, the promise of the concept is that most people out who are not international relations scholars think it's important. I teach an introductory course to my students, and at the end of the semester I was asked them, what were the three most important readings? And Huntington's article is always on that list for the last 20 years. Uh, scholars don't think this is, this is a concept which is musty and old and from the 19th century and maybe politically incorrect. They don't like it. Uh, but uh, I go with my freshmen, not with the professors. So. So I think it's important because it resonates, and I think it's important because I think Huntington's conceptualization is the wrong one. It's a very old-fashioned way of thinking about mm -hmm. it. Even though he said, I want to tell you the new way of thinking about things, it's a very old way of thinking, 19th century. And how do you engage with Huntington's concept, and how do you set out the differences between your concept and So I use him as a, as a foil. I thought it was an argument with Huntington, at the beginning, but it turns out to be as important an argument with all my liberal friends. Mm -hmm. uh, so Hunting basically says this is a world of plural civilizations. They're internally coherent. Uh, values coalesce around one thing, the American way or American liberalism or Chinese Confucianism or something. And, uh, uh, but the world itself is plural. So we cannot be holding people to our standards because their standards are different. So it's a value relativist position. Uh, the liberals say, no, there are all these conversations in these different countries. There's pluralist competition of ideas in the marketplace. And people disagree with each other. And, uh, but there's only one set of values internationally. Yeah. Guess which one? Ours, of course. Mm -hmm. right? so, so while I was very clear about hunting being the target of it first, it became increasingly clear to me that it was a dual target. Mm -hmm. I object to Huntington's conceptualization of civilization, and I accept a modified version of value relativism, uh, and I re accept the liberal insistence on pluralism, mm -hmm. internal, and I reject their monism in terms of international values. So value relativism is modified because I think that the human, right, human well-being and human rights are now a set of processes which all political authorities have to pay at least verbal uh, obedience to. Exactly, yeah. Because you're talking about this concept of a world civilization that is entailing some 
values. Right. Um, what would be the core values of, of this civilization? And right. I was wondering, actually, now with all the attacks on the Western world, um, where do we head in terms of a world civilization? Is there something forming now that we can also observe empirically, or is this yeah, well still a vision? I mean, the mm -hmm. attacks on the Western world, let's not forget that uh, some of the architects of 9-11 were trained in Florida and were studying in my hometown of Hamburg. Uh, this was a part of an attack from the inside and that the attacks on Paris were committed largely by French citizens. So it's not, a, it's not from outside. Some elements are from the outside, but mostly it's from the inside, which reinforces the point that it's pluralist inside. Mm. Right? Uh, and fundamental disagreements about human rights and human well-being. Mm. Right, so. so it's not a clash of civilizations in a Huntington sense among or yeah among different civilizations. But it, no, I I, I think the politically the clash is a political project. Mm. It has to be created, and Huntington assumes it's something natural. Mm. And so Huntington says there are two clashes. There's one between Islam and the West, and the other is between between China and yeah. the West. And I think the elements of a clash between parts of Islam, a radical jihadist version, and the West. And so I would say, yeah, there's something there. Mm -hmm. uh, but the clash itself is a construction on both sides of the divide. And in American politics right now, you know, in the mm -hmm. fall of 2015, you can see the politics of fear and anxiety creating or reinforcing it. Mm -hmm. But the clash with China, which he was predicting in the mid-1990s hasn't happened. Mm. And, uh, so it's a reasonable social science theory, one right, one wrong, that mm. is the probability is 0.5 or random. And that's not bad for social science, most of the time you're in that range. Mm. Right. Yeah. I was, um, so the point came to my mind when I read um, about an Indonesian Muslim organization, um, which has more than 50 million members called Nahdlatul Ulama, and they actually created a campaign, a global campaign to outlaw ISIS as non-Islamic. And this was the point where I started thinking maybe we are now getting to this point of a world civilization that we were imagining as a civilization of modernity with the common secular values and ov overlapping rel religious beliefs. And maybe there is something to it that we can now observe empirically. Well, Islam, I mean, let's just call it hyphenated Islam. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a debate about Euro-Islam in Europe, mm -hmm. right? Uh, France is in a particular position because it's not accepting that. Mm -hmm. uh, Senegal and Afro-Islam, and of course Indonesia, Indonesia. Islam is global and it creates hybrid, it, is a, it creates hybrid processes. And uh, France will solve its problems only by accepting hybridity, mm -hmm. and a version of Frank, France Islam. And France is very far away from that. Right? Uh, but if there's a French Islam, then they would also have to accept some French Christianity or yes, French yes. Buddhism. Yes, that's, exact, that's exactly the point which other religious communities make. But that's so one this of the fundamental values of France, the laicity. Yes, this is why the fundamental values have to be contested mm. and con are contestable. It happens in all civilizations. Mm. So France is a nation state. Mm. I think this is a European wide right debate. And Europe is, you know, having that debate yeah. in various forms. You know, I think I don't shrink back from that debate. I think mm. it's essential. Uh, so. And when do we get to this point that civilizations change their values? What would be the prerequisite for it, or what dynamics do we need for it? I think civilizations change all the time. I mean, the typical thing is not civilizational clash. The civ civil typical thing is civilizational encounters and engagement. It happens all the time. Mm. Think about I don't know the but culture of mass capitalism, mass consumption. The, the the concept of civilizations then becoming very fluid if it's changing all the time. So we have to have some. The well, set the of outcome, values. the outcome. So if you're saying what's the outcome worth explaining, Hunting says clash. I say clash and engagement and encounters. Mm. So I have a somewhat broader view of what is worth explaining. Uh, uh, civilizations are not. The, you know, it's a community of meaning of power and practices, yeah. like the nation state, like patriotism, right? Yeah. So it's just a meaning community at a higher level. Yeah. Right, so. No, it's a much more dynamic concept than yes. the static concept of yeah. Huntington, of yeah. course.
words. Um, but still, I think if we're coming back to this characterization of civilization as a value-based community, there has to be something stable in there. That's, that's the big debate. So no. take, for example, the Western civilization and its practices of human rights. Mm -hmm. So if you look at Western civilization, and I will now narrow it down to Anglo-America, you know, in the 19th century, it was defined by empire, it was defined by race, and it was defined by a version of liberalism. Yeah. Western civilization, as it is invoked today, is not defined by empire, mm. is not defined by race, it's defined by some part or some version of liberalism. So we have substituted complex sovereignty for empire, and we have substituted multi-rationalism for race and we refer to the same entity, mm. the West. So the West is an empty category and we fill it up with different content mm. over time. So how fast? I always think it takes, you know, for us to track it empirically, a couple of generations. Mm. I mean, civilization change more slowly than nation states. Mm. They're larger constructs. Yeah. And um, what is the West today? Because I you're haven't saying a clue, I haven't a clue. <laughs> I, read it, I read it in the newspapers all the time. Yeah. I always say, West, uh, pe Western people West. say, what you're studying is sort of not really important. I say, okay, I'll make you a bet. Uh, let's take the headlines of a front page of any newspaper in the world and let's count for a week or a month or a year, whatever you want to count, and find your research interest there, and I use West and East. And nobody's been willing to make the bet. Mm. But West and East are all pervasive mm. as vocabulary. Mm. Right? So, um, I think it's highly topical, and it is a simple. It provides for a simplified map of the world, but a simplification of the of the map, which is so severe, distorts so much, that the policies and the politics which emerge from it uh, can be catastrophic. Mm. And so, when Donald Trump says we will prevent Muslims from coming to the United States because there might be a terrorist or two. It's a simplification which could be catastrophic. Mm, yeah. so, no, um, so it's. But it then still, religion is still an important component in the us versus them debate. And well, it depends on your definition of religion. So you mean religion as doctrinal or practiced religion with a transcendental component. Mm. If you broaden it out, as many students of religion do, to include civil religion, mm. America is a very strong civil religion. It's also very religious in other ways, right? Uh, then religion is always part of it. Mm. That you were referring to the 18th century before as this modernist civilization. It's a religion. Mm. It's a civil religion which replaced the Catholic Church and it put knowledge and science on the pedestal. Mm. That's our new God. Okay, well, I can live with that. Mm. So I regard it as a religion of sorts uh, with its own code, the scientific code, right? And I would call it civil religion. Mm. Right? Yes, religion is very, very central to it civilization analysis. Yeah. Yeah. And at some point it can also be dangerous though, because if this so. concept is so fluid and we can put so many values in there, then it can be used rhetorically for... Yes, but so can science. Yeah. Yes. Science can be very dangerous. So I just read a novel called The Glass Room, and in it appears a, a German character in uh, Bruno then Moravia, right? Mm -hmm. And he was measuring the head size and ankle size of various people because he wanted to figure out whether there were genetic types that could be tracked, so that you knew who the Slavs and the Jews were mm -hmm. right, by objective criteria. Yeah, that was contemporary science in the 1940s, mm -hmm. practiced in Germany. And that science was very prominent, not just in Germany. I mean, this is a deep strand of some version of biology which goes back and in Europe and the United States in the late 19th century. Mm. So it's not just a German aberration. Science can be dangerous. Social science as well. Social yeah. science can also be dangerous yeah. to finish this strand of thinking. <laughs> so there is this head of the Federal Reserve, right? His name is Alan Greenspan. Yeah. After he stopped being head of the Reserve and the financial crash, he writes a book and it's called The Map and the Territory. Mm. And at the age of 88, he um, was willing and able to admit the map was inadequate for the territory. Well, that's what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. I'd like to come back to the role of social scientists in the real world um, yeah. later on. Just one more or two more questions on the civilizations debate. Um, especially if we are now in this 
situation of defending our values against some inner or outer forces battling against the core values of the Western civilization, for example, then for me the question is how pluralist can we be or where are the boundaries of a civilization's tolerance towards another or an opponent of the civilization? Yeah, so I'm not willing to grant you the ca category we. We are disagreeing about what to do. Yeah. Embodying different values and commitments to who we are. Yeah. And that debate is very active in France right now. Right? So where the majority of the we is adhering to a, it's just called a Huntingtonian mm. characterization, which says we must coalesce, we, we are united, this is, a, this is not a conflict, this is a war. Right? And in our domestic arrangements, we are French, we are secularists, we cannot accept a lot of things. Right? Uh, and then the Frenchmen are saying, the minority for sure, saying, that's going to be self-defeating. Mm. That's not a smart way to do it. Right? Yeah. We had the same debate in America in yeah. after 9-11. Right? Well, we said it was a war on terror and see what happened. Mm. That conceptualization wasn't adequate. It was the wrong map for the territory. Yeah. Oh. So I think the Europeans are just in the... Mm. Right now, making the same mistakes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, we thought we would learn from. No, that. it's hard to learn. Yeah. Well, since we've been talking about the U.S. already, um, you also wrote a book on, on U.S. power or pop power in general, and um, maybe as a start up with the question, how would you char characterize the U.S. power today? Is it becoming maybe less multidimensional than it was before? Um, so I would introduce, I would pose the question slightly differently. How do you characterize U.S. power as opposed to American power? Mm -hmm. Think about the phenomenon of anti-Americanism. Yeah. It actually is not anti-American. It's anti-U.S. That is, it's directed against the political manifestations of it, right, which we call the United States. It's political practices, the politics of empire. Right? America, American civil society, in various institutions are deeply admired around the world, including in the Middle East. So the U.S. Jordan is, for example, is a you know is one of the closest allies of the United States, of support of the United, not allies, support of the United States, huh? and pro-Americanism sentiments are very strong, but mm. anti-Americanism is enormously strong. Mm. You, know, I mean, you like the United States? Yeah, four or five percent of the Jordanians mm. would say so in other places and it'll want to 2%. Right? Mm -hmm. You like America? Yeah, America's cool. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, or American University, great, you know, I like to go there, you know, American movies, wonderful. You know. There are a lot of aspects of American civil society which are deeply attractive. Mm -hmm. right? so, so I would make this what's happening to the US power. You know, US power is, you know, power has become more complicated and multidimensional and the US in relative terms is losing power compared to others and compared to a more complex environment. But American power is not declining. Mm. And so you then have to ask yourself, how important is hard power as opposed to soft power? And people say, well, it's only hard power. I say, well, if it's only hard power, you're giving up a lot. Mm. Right? It's a Joe Nye's argument all the time. He's right. Mm. You know? So when China, which is rising rapidly, wants to institute its Confucius Institute and give an alternative Nobel Prize, I say, they are lacking an important dimension of power, mm. which will make it very hard for them to become a global power. Yeah. They will be a regional power. No, I, I totally agree that the greatest strength of American power right now is its knowledge, and we talked about this imaginative imagination, the role, the, the importance of imagination in the society. But So this would, in your categorization, fall into the American power, company, yes. not in the US power. Right, so you shifted. You said well, the first question was U.S. power, and now you said American, American power. power. So okay. I already drawn so your cross. This is good. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, but but isn't it also this soft power aspect, which is um, also creating fierce opposition in some other parts of yes. the world? And this is what um, what a back, also a backlash, it, right? Yeah, so, backlash. So you can think of issues like LGBT rights, yes, right, uh, in Africa and the Middle East, uh, yeah. the things which are self-explanatory in Europe, green environment, not self-explanatory in the United States, mm -hmm. but America, right? So, which is to say, 
that the conflict about values and what we should do at the global level has not diminished. In some ways, it's accentuated because there's this feeling we cannot stop this process. This process of Americanization or Westernization is insidious. It's implanting itself in the practices and the thought patterns of the young. And mm. Our societies will lose their coherence. Mm. I remember this from my parents. Mm. Elvis Presley in the 1950s, terrible. Okay, Beethoven, great. And just because my parents, you. just because my parents said that, I said Elvis Presley, mm. great. Beethoven, terrible. Just in order to stoke the fire, right? So, so this is this was true in Europe. Mm. You know, in Europe was at the elite, especially in France, but in general, very anti-American mm. in the 50s. And there's a very strong current of anti-American in Europe has always been there yeah. since the beginning of the Republic. But this was me would mean that it's always involving conflict. Contestation. Okay. So, whether the contestation goes across the boundary of violence, mm. that will that depend on the specific. Yeah. Anarchism in the late 19th century, a Western phenomenon, crossed the boundary. We've forgotten that we had a lot of anarchists. Mm -hmm. They are now our, our brothers, right? Our brothers in arms as we think about anti-Catholicism. Mm. I mean, anti-Catholicism, it's not so long ago yeah. that a presidential candidate in the United States had to say, I'm a Catholic, but I'm American. You mm. can vote for me. That was in 1960. Yeah. Okay. And only in 2012. Did somebody have to give a speech to them? I'm a candidate for the presidential uh, uh, office of president, and I'm a Mormon. Mm, yeah. Had to give a special speech, mm. right? And in 2012, it was m much less of a deal than in 1960. Mm. Right? But the whatever they called the ultra Montes, they were called the mm. Catholics. They were like like Islam. Mm. I mean, they were threatened, despised, you know, and uh, subversive. So it took three generations for people to say, well, they were not all bad. Yeah. Mm. And looking from now into the future, what would you say is the role of America for the West as a civilization? And it will remain subversive. I think this human rights, human well-being revolution no longer rooted only in the United States of America. It mm. has acquired its own momentum. Is there as an aspect of global politics, which no political authority will be able to deny. Mm. So, so it's there. And on the other side, we have Europe, the Anglo-American part of your civilization concept of the West. Um, but Europe now is struggling. So where do we heading with our yeah. identity, yeah. given the the disintegrating forces of, of yeah. the European I mean, I think Union. the European project is an elite project. It's always been an elite project, mm -hmm. right? I mean, if you look at public opinion polls, when Europe was doing well in the 60s and the 80s, 90s, you know. Yeah, it varied between, the pro-European component was around 50%. Mm. The elite component was above 85%. Mm. So yeah. it's a great disjunction between the elite politics right, and of perception. And most people say, yeah, I'm also European. I'm British, I'm French. Oh no, I'm not British, I'm English and I'm Scottish. You mm. see how there the balance changes, right? So it's not that one identity replaces the other. No, people are quite flexible, mm -hmm. and then there's a situational logic in which they choose one or the other. Yeah. And at the dinner table, they don't choose being European or English or Scottish. They choose some other identity. Mm -hmm. right? So, yeah. so we, are, we, are adding, we are adding to the menu, and we're choosing. Mm. So is there a European project forever a closer union? I think this is a conceit by a very sh small straight of Mm. European elites, mm. and I always wondered why they are so committed to it, when a lot of other Europeans are committed to something different, and mm. they have the votes. So it's going to change. Yeah. In one way. Yeah, I, I think you know people will say, well, you voted for the monetary union in 1990 because of the political context. There was fear of Germany. Mm. Twenty-five years later, people saying, oh, we're afraid of Germany. So we don't invading us, so we know? might might not, yeah, we might actually say get rid of it or loosen it up or mm. introduce multiple currencies. I mean, economists and multiple currencies, they got a long history of dealing with it. Mm. The notion that you had one territorial currency is only 150 years old. Mm. Previous 800 years of capitalism didn't have that. So why wouldn't you want to go back to that? Right? But if Europe now is disintegrating, isn't then the West as well disintegrating? No, because Europe is not, I mean, if I live in Mexico, I'm in the West. Mm. 
something changes in Europe. Okay, something in Europe is changing, not the West is changing. I think that's a European conceit to identify itself as the West. Well, of course, yeah. Right. And just think but how Europe has changed, you know. I mean, when I wrote my dissertation on, you mentioned it, you know, on Austria, it was about the Austro-Hungarian Empire, mm -hmm. half of it. I was sitting in Vienna, and I knew nothing about Slovakia the Czech Republic and that many of the places I was studying were actually a tram ride away from mm -hmm. Vienna, downtown Vienna, half an hour. Well, the Cold War had, f had eliminated the east-west dimension of Europe. Mm -hmm. I was hired as the Central European Specialist by Cornell. And I said, what's your definition of Central Europe? And they said, anything between Norway and Sicily. <laughs> That's what I would <laughs> understand as a plastic understanding <laughs> of geography, right? Well, but geography is plastic, so, you know, and NATO was formed, you know, and there was a, I think a senator from Kansas. He said, this NATO business, Mr. Atchison, I understand the North Atlantic, but why on earth is Italy part of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization? And Atchison, or was it Kenner, I think it was Atchison, Atchison said, that, Senator, sometimes the laws of geography have to give in to the laws of politics. Geography is imagined to mm. some extent. Right? So yeah, it's constructed by politics. Yeah. Not totally. It has materiality, yeah. but it's also constructed, political. Yeah. 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 I would like to ask you a little bit more about political science as a discipline and um, our role as political scientists in society, because we're usually very careful to give predictions or um, to give advice to real world politicians. And this morning in the masterclass, you just said that you think you predict the big crisis is still coming. So you were making a prediction, but this is rare in political science, I, from what I recognize among the scholars. But at the same time, I have the feeling that expectations are actually rising, that we're even more addressed by politicians, by the society, to answer very important questions that most of us are affecting us right now. And I feel myself uncomfortable because I'm getting addressed all kinds of questions that I don't have any expertise in. So I was wondering, how do you feel uh, when you're addressed as an expert to answer on crisis X or crisis Z in some places in the world? And how often do you, have you been in situations where you were called upon as an expert but actually didn't have any clue about what you were talking about? Very rarely. I live in upstate New York. Nobody asks my opinion. So. <laughs> Maybe but go to a remote place. <laughs> yeah, no, and I go to remote places like Florence, you know, so. Yeah. <laughs> so, no, it, I mean, they, I think you have to think about how the productions of political and political science knowledge construct. So there's scholarship, it's an outer ring, okay. There is a intermediary ring of translators, think tanks. Mm -hmm. They read the scholarship, they take some ideas which look promising, they package it, Sometimes they do research, often they don't. And then they are the advisors, okay? And the advisors read the abstract, mm. okay? That is, they read at most a page. If you can't put it down in a page, because they brief, let's say, the Secretary of State, as the Secretary of State walks from one meeting to the next, so they have only about a minute and a half. And he has to be fully focused and watch his language very carefully. So there's a sort of a compression of knowledge, mm. right? So, uh, what as a scholar, when people ask you as a scholar, give policy advice, I was saying, you know what, I think you, there are other people mm -hmm. sitting in Washington doing this for a living because they know the political context in which the knowledge becomes meaningful. And I know you're talking to them. So, why are you asking me? Mm -hmm. And they say, well, you know, having a professor, it sort of adds cachet to the advice which is the public expectation somehow that because it comes from a professor, it has to be more true. Mm -hmm. I don't believe that. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't predicting, I was making conjectures. That's mm -hmm. a big difference for me. You know, yeah. I think mm -hmm. social science and political science makes conjectures. I don't think it makes predictions. Although many people say, I make a prediction, but I think they're fooling themselves. Mm -hmm. okay. I think if you know what you're talking about, you can rule out some scenarios and you can rule in some scenarios for practical decisions. And that requires knowledge and judgment, so and a certain amount of experience. Mm. Right? Uh, uh, this, I think, political science can deliver. Yeah. But don't we have the responsibility to act a little bit more like these public intellectuals that maybe were more active in the 60s right. and 70s than today? Yeah. No, I think there's a lot of public, pub being public intellectuals become much easier now. 
So if you're saying I'm a public intellectual, if I get my uh, column published in the New York Times on the Frankfurt or uh, Metzodon or whatever Italian paper it is, that's a very narrow definition okay. of public. No, I was talking right? more in, in terms of what you as the critical engagement of the. Yeah, but if you think about the blogosphere, many young political scientists mm -hmm. spend, I'd say, looking at their CVs, 10, 15% of their time playing a role which I did never played in my life. Mm. It's easy now, and they do it with gusto, mm. and it contributes to some collective understanding of what's going on. Right? Uh, and it's fun, mm. right? so that's why they're doing it. Uh, so in some ways, I think the public role of political science and social science has increased in the last 20 years quite substantially, and it will increase further, and it will undermine scholarship. Mm -hmm. I think this is becoming, you know, it's so, it's like a sugar high, it's mm. so attractive, you know, people go easy from 15 to 50%. Yeah. Well, so you do that for two years, you do that for two years, it'll be hard to climb down back to 15%. Mm. There's a certain excitement about it. Yeah. So. And if the demand is rising. Is and the demand is always there. I mean, we are sitting here having this interview, mm. right? You don't know, and I don't know who's going to ever watch it. But EUI feels very, it's very important to be present in the web. It's mm. an institutional requirement, but yeah. I'm saying it for now. We'll see the clicks after. <laughs> Looking back at your now three decades of experience in uh, political science academia, what would you say were the most important developments both in IR research and in real world with influence on IR research? Oh, I'm so happy that you're miscalculating my age. Uh, so <coughs> three decades, I wish that was true. <laughs> I would still have 10 good years ahead of me. So, uh, so I think, you know, when I went to graduate school and was the year of the behavioral revolution. It was the tail end of the behavioral revolution. Quantification, operationalization, and it coincided with the demonstrations against the Vietnam War. And the anti-war movement in behavioralism clashed. It was a political, scientific clash, mm -hmm. deeply politicized. And there was you know, the demand for an alternative political science and all of that. Right? And that generated a lot of heat, some light, uh, and out of it eventually came something different. Let's just call it historic institutionalism, mm -hmm. okay, which wasn't part quantitative, but qualitative. Uh, we have, in the last, I'd say, 15, 20 years, moved back to what I would call behavioralism point two. It's some belief that there's for the science is more in, more in the United yeah. States, less in Europe, but uh, but it's also in Europe. I mean, if you look at yeah. Oxford political science, it's gone that way. Mm -hmm. you know? part of Scandinavia has gone that yeah. way, so uh, France mm, lives in its own orbit. Yeah. You know, Germany is a hybrid, it integrates both traditions. So, um, so there is something changing again, but there is no anti-war movement because mm. students no longer get drafted. So they are multiple depoliticized. Mm. So the int it's an intellectual debate, not infused with politics. And that makes you know, it's easier for people to self-segregate and say, well, I belong in this camp and I belong in that camp, and there's no political conflict between mm -hmm. us. And so that's what's happening now. And uh, in the end, you know, I think good common sense prevails even in science. You know, and I think, what do innovations bring in terms of substantive knowledge? And there, you know, people will draw different conclusions. Some people say, this is an exciting new turn, I'm really learning very important new things which I never knew about. Mm. And other people saying, you know what? The increments of learning diminish further and further and further. So then actually many of the articles now should be research notes because they're not asking interesting questions. Mm. And then maybe in part that the interesting questions have been asked and we have worked through the answers and now we're at a very specialized level. And then a new big question will arise, mm. maybe. Right? But or maybe we're just not asking the right questions. I'm not sure what the right question is, an important question, yeah. something which people feel really matters. And I read journals now, I say often, I don't think the author actually thinks it's a very important question. Yeah. They contribute to the literature, they yeah. apply a new method. But I don't, I don't get the sense that they think this is a really important question, mm -hmm. and sometimes they do. So I think there is a self-correction, yeah. and that we probably, you know, the pendulum is swinging, and there will be some self-correction. The other thing is that the context of political science and social science has totally changed. It's global now. Mm. You know, I mean, when there are, I don't know, the, the number of students in China increased by 10 million within five years. 
probably 50 new universities. Nice. Probably, I'm making this up, 100 new social science journals. Probably 10 new political science journals in the last five years. Yeah. So we, we are not seeing that. It's having an enormous effect. The same is going to happen in India. Okay. In India, in vernacular languages, not in English. Yeah. The linguistic revolution in India is vernacular. Right? It's been going on for 40 years. So that the global context in which this evolves is going to be different. And the topics which matter in Europe look rather quaint mm. from other perspectives of the Middle East or China. So very Euro-focused. Right? The methods used by the United States, by, by, by uh, international relations or political science scholars in, in, in the United States, look rather quaint mm. to the Europeans and many other places. So the insularity and the self-encapsulation of different social science communities will become more prominent. Mm. And uh, I think in the end this will enrich the conversation because people will, there will be more food on the table from which you can sample. And we can see it already that the International Studies Association meeting, you know, which used to be 3,000 people, 15 years ago, is now 7,500 yeah. people. And the range of mm. people coming is interesting. Mm. You know, it's not quite as professional as after, but it is interesting. And when foreign scholars have a choice, they say you get one trip to the United States. Mm. Without fail, they say, we'll go to the ISA, we're not going to the ASA meeting. Mm. So that's already voting with your feet. Mm. You know? So I think this is really different from 40 years ago. Mm. Right? So. And what would your recommendations be for young IR scholars today with the challenges that we are facing? I mean, we're now in this very prestigious Max Weber program, but afterwards we're moving on, we're moving on to another limited contract, we're moving on with mobility challenges, with challenges in family planning, dual careers, right. dual careers. <coughs> where, where should we orient ourselves to become scholars? So I think you can't forget the audience for which you're writing, that's the most important thing, and early in your career you're writing for an audience which will control the power of giving you a contract or not. And you can't deny yourself the right to study what you want to study because otherwise you don't get out of bed in the morning. Mm. So striking that balance right, that is writing for an audience, which you may not deeply care about, but which has the purse, and writing and researching about something which you really care about, so that you get out of bed in the morning, that balance needs to be struck and you need to get advice. And that's why having smart fellow students and professors who can advise you really important. It is a matter of balancing. Later on, once you have made your way, you make your own choices. At the beginning, you have to strike that balance. Mm. Thank you. It's good to have you here for getting some advice on Thanks. that. And we're looking forward to your lecture. Thank you.